Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. Got a great show for you tonight. We're coming up on the draft in now four days' time. We're doing this on the night of the 23rd. Thursday, the 27th, will be the football New Year, as we call it, the first night of the NFL draft. And joining me to talk about a new NFL draft trade prediction tool is Philippe Dayback. Philip, Philippe, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Ken. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, great to have you on. We've we've done things before. Uh, folks who who went to the uh, analytics night at Fazzini's in I think it was in 2019 or 2018 uh, saw Philippe do an outstanding presentation on uh, how to do visualizations for sports or for other things for that matter. And uh, Philippe has a, a tell me what your PhD is in uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, like specifically. Um, trying to create computer models to predict things is what I usually tell people. All right. Outstanding stuff. And uh, a- anytime I've heard what he's working on, I've always been interested in, but I couldn't be more interested than this particular tool, which is uh, a trade prediction tool. Do I have that, that correct? That's correct. All right. So tell me a little bit about what problem you're trying to solve with the tool. Yeah. So um, I guess I, I like uh, through like listening to your podcast, I, uh, I heard always like discussing the different trades um, and I was like interested in exploring the uh, world of trades and trying to identify uh, which trades would be the most uh, possible with between do- uh, between two teams um, and specifically looking at the draft value. Um, and so the Jimmy Johnson, uh, J- uh, I'm a, a JJ chart. Okay. Now I saw your tool actually includes others. But let's talk at a, at a higher level first. Um, Eric DaCosta, of course, at the Liars Luncheon, talked about wanting to acquire other additional picks. One of the things that I've kind of been thinking about is if they're not trading the first pick in a, in a draft where they don't have a second, it doesn't really matter very much because the total amount of capital exchanged will not be that much. But about what percentage in terms of JJ is that first pick of the Ravens total draft value this year. Yeah, the first pick is a is I'm a uh a, 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 a 780 points, which is a 76% of their total draft uh capital this time. So I definitely agree with you. If you're not trading the first one, you're not going to get much value for the other ones. Um and then you're going to be picking at the bottom of the barrel. Um so if uh if DeCosta was actually, you know, not lying during the luncheon, which I believe that we would probably think that he was telling the truth of wanting to get more draft picks. Um, they, uh, they definitely should be trading the first one. It's definitely the Ravens have certainly enough needs that the number of picks does not seem adequate. Meaning even if they hit on all five picks, it really might not necessarily fill all their needs needing cornerback cornerback, probably starting with a, you know, an outside corner for sure. Maybe a slot corner in addition, they always need an offensive lineman, and he, he made that comment. They really need a defensive lineman this year. A lot of people think they need a running back. They may need a quarterback. Um, and the Ravens do have some additional ways of acquiring capital that are not through pick-for-pick pick trades. We're not going to go into that tonight, but we will remind people, possible they might trade Lamar Jackson before the draft. That would certainly completely change the profile of available draft capital. And another possibility would be that they trade Patrick Queen. Uh, either during the draft or uh, prior to the draft. And that certainly would, I would project it to have a a fairly significant return for them. Maybe a third round pick, maybe a second for a third uh, would be another possibility. Yeah. And uh, if they're trading Lamar, they may be trading up um, to then try to get a a, quarterback high up, which um, like people have speculated the Colts, for instance, could be like a possible trading source. But I think beyond a Lamar trade, we're probably looking for a trade down on this first pick. Okay. All right. Now trade trading down in this draft. A lot of people have commented that it might be a difficult thing to do because a lot of people think there's a very, uh, shallow, uh, gradual is the word I'm looking for, gradation of talent between 20 and 45. And so with the Ravens stuck at 22, you also need someone who's motivated to trade up and doesn't think I can just sit here and wait and there'll be equivalent talents. Yeah. Um, uh, I definitely looked within this tool more at like a JJ value, but uh, I've definitely heard that. And it does seem to be a like talent um, uh uh, very like top heavy towards the draft and it does go down. So it may be tough to get some of those trade downs, but 
um, I think that they're like it seems to be like every year teams, you know, uh, they they like really love some players, so they want to trade that couple picks up just to get that move from like a twenty four up to a twenty two, um, and you know, in that kind of scenario, the Ravens should just take whatever they can get, um, and so I think that we should be able to find somebody at the end of the day, even if it's just trading out of the first round too. All right. Okay. Well, that's standing. Well, let's let's start by. Uh, talking about what trades might make sense. How how would you like to do this by division or by how how would you like to organize this? Yeah, um, I think first we can just maybe uh, 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 get rid of some teams that we just think are not going to be that, and then start to know our, uh, 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 narrow our focus a little bit more. Sure. So who's who are some teams that really don't make any sense at all, and you organize this any way you like in terms of division or teams, whatever you like. Sure, I guess like going based off of division uh, within the East, uh, the the Dolphins don't have any first round picks, so um, just don't expect them to do anything within that. Um, I also would expect like the Patriots and the Jets not to, just because they already have a high pick. Um, they're going to be looking to trade down. So within these kinds of teams, I would expect um, them to trade up only if they traded you know way outside and they want to get back into it, but. Um, that's usually, I would think, uh, a little bit less likely. The Browns don't have any. Uh, so then if we move to the north, uh, the Browns have no picks at all until the third round. So um, they can't even come up with enough uh, draft capital uh, for the 780 that the Ravens uh, have within that first pick. But by comparison, just so people understand how terrible it is to only have a third round pick. But I think we get a little bit of insight into that from the Ravens value being 76 percent in that first round. What do the Browns have in terms of total draft capital this this year? Uh, five thirty one. Okay. So they would be uh, two hundred picks less than the Ravens' number one pick, um, or uh, draft value points. So that's equivalent to like around three, uh, around like seventy four, seventy five. Okay. So, maybe a second next year. Uh, yes, we're then a second next year. So that's so that's the kind of disparity that they have if they want to uh, trade up to get our number one pick. Okay. Um, that's why I, I kind of just uh, view the Browns as a uh, not option. All um, right, keep going. Moving into the South the and the Titans as well, uh, they already have a number 11 pick, so it's similar to the Patriots and Jets where they would need to go back up. Um, moving to the West, the, uh, the Chargers have the 21st pick, so I think it's less likely to move only one spot. Uh, and the Broncos, again, just have a low amount of picks and no first-round picks, similar to the Browns. Okay, so uh, that's those. Are, those certainly seem like eliminations. There, move over to the NFC. Yeah, uh, the uh, um, uh, NFC has less, uh, I would say, of uh, guaranteed nos. Um, but ones that I would say are low are within the East: uh, Eagles and the Commanders. Um, both of them, the Ravens would have to take on uh, a pretty significant JJ value, like a one hundred and eighty to be able to uh, come up with like a uh, fair compensation. Meaning they'd have to, they'd have to lose 180 on the trade. Correct. Okay. The uh, Ravens would have to lose 180 on the trade. Right. That seems um, unlikely. And so for this conversation, I guess we're just uh, looking at only this year's uh, draft picks. Um, the Ravens could try to acquire future draft picks, but uh, uh, they really need it this year. So it's like less likely. And so my tool doesn't have the future draft picks yet, but uh, I don't think it's necessary just because of how this year is really constrained. Completely agree with that comment. I mean, in in, in a year where DaCosta is saying he wants more draft picks, he obviously means for the holes that we have right now, he doesn't want more future draft picks. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, and there are there have been years where I felt it would be really nice if the Ravens could reset their draft, but uh, this ain't one of them. <laughs> Definitely. All right. So you're on the NFC North now? Yep. Uh, on the north, uh, the Vikings are also low because um, they're at the 23rd. So once again, just moving one spot gets you like a round five pick. And uh, I don't think that's um, something that the Ravens will be looking for. Definitely looking for more. Um, uh, and then moving into the south, the Buccaneers and the Panthers also are a pretty big deficit for the Ravens of like a uh, 200 points roughly for, for the JJ uh, and that they'd have to take on. Um and then moving into the West, the 49ers have a lot of picks, but it's just not enough to make up that kind of gap um, that they would need. And the Rams and the Cardinals as well are, um, the Rams especially are a team that looking like they're trying to tank this year, so less likely for them to want to move back up. Right. Are, now, when you did this, are you trying to 
uh, restrict the total number of picks that are exchanged in some way? Yeah, good question. Um, so within my tool, you can select the, the maximum number of, uh, of basically your picks and that you'll add on. And you can also restrict the number of picks and that and so that the other team will give up. So I restrict it to like three from yourself. So that includes the Ravens number 22. And then I restrict it down to four or also three sometimes for the other team. Um, looking at last year's draft on day one, the trades were, were like usually one for three, two for four, one for four. Um, so a team is not going to give up more than four picks. And those are usually like a number 11, number 13, something really high up. For the number 22, that would be less likely um, unless some quarterback falls down, which we definitely wish for every year for yeah. like other teams to go for. <laughs> Yeah, it would be great if Anthony Richardson dropped a 22, but then the Ravens would have a dilemma on their hands, I guess. Definitely. Uh, all right, so you've gone through the divisions here. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about what trades maybe do make sense, or, or would you like to talk about the methodology more, or how would you like to present this? Yeah, uh, we can talk about the methodology, I guess, before we talk about some of the teams that we think are more likely. Okay. Um, so the tool... Uh, uses whatever value chart that you select. And so for this, we're using the uh, JJ. Um, you can select which way you'd like to trade if you want to do an up and down movement or if you want only up, only down. And, then, and you can set a threshold for the JJ difference between the receiving and the giving team. Um, and then as we talked about, the maximum number of picks as well that both teams give. Okay, now I don't think we're going to show this in a video, but I will say this. This is so you, Philippe. I, you know, knowing you from for, for these years, I've known you now. You, you have nine different trade value charts, and we've restricted this to JJ that we're talking about. But you have Jimmy Johnson, Rich Hill, Fitzgerald, Spielberger, Kevin Mears, PFF, Michael Lopez, Chase Stewart, Ben Baldwin, surplus value, and Ben Baldwin on field value. Impressive. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can definitely uh, uh, move around a lot throughout the tool to try to find the best trade value. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and so it's definitely be interesting, like um, which one maybe will show some different results. So one of the things, Jimmy Johnson is usually what we talk about on draft night. I think there's still evidence, particularly in the early rounds, that more trades are done by Jimmy Johnson value. And maybe you could even tell me that, try to, try to look at past trades to see how closely they matched up. But all the other valuation scales are various degrees of flatter in terms of uh, relative to, to to talent drop off as you as you go through the rounds. So JJ's extremely peaked with three thousand for the first pick, and I think one for Mister Irrelevant might even be less than that. Um, and then others maybe go from a thousand to ones. So they're less they're 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 less peaked uh, that you'd see. And and uh, uh, I do have a problem with some of these, particularly some of the ones that are AV based. I just wanted to make the point that. AV, an of AV of two, kind of like a war of 0.5 for a baseball player who's a full-time player, is not a good thing. And and you know they're saying two is better than zero. And I, if if this were baseball and we were looking at war, 0.5 wouldn't be better than zero. You'd rather not have that player at all. And uh, that, that's that's and one of the things is it doesn't really subtract out the replacement level properly. And Fitzgerald Spielberger, the PFF method, is the one that I really associate with that most closely. But there are others, I think, that are AV-based as well. Uh, yeah, definitely the uh, JJ chart seems to be the one that the teams follow in the beginning. And that uh, talent drop-off within the chart or the point drop-off uh, seems to kind of coincide with the kind of risk that you're taking between players or the kind of value that you're getting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely agree with you on that being like a good metric to look at between the um, rounds. All right. All right. It's outstanding. So now we, we've talked a little bit about the, about the various charts that are available. What else would do you want to talk about the tools? So you've got the, you've got a number of picks you can trade. And I remember when you sent me the first version of this, you had some exact JJ value matches that might've involved like a six for one trade in terms of draft picks. And we kind of talked a little bit about that and decided maybe that's not reasonable. Maybe it, the, the team who's trading with you should never want to trade away more than one additional pick or maybe two additional picks. So they do four for two, they do three for one maybe, and they'll do two for one or two for two a lot. But it's most of the time 
you know, even when you're trading down, you don't necessarily pick up picks because your counterparty won't want to give up net picks. Yeah, uh, when I saw the six for one result for my tool, you know, when I first sent it to you before we made this modification, I was like, somebody needs to get this to Toma de Costa. Like, this is, you know, this is a great <laughs> trade. This is great for the Ravens. But yeah, definitely look at other teams. Uh, they do more of a uh, four to one, three to one um, type of trade. So um, uh, we definitely tried to restrain that. I think it worked out better. Um, and the methodology of the tool is that then it just goes through all the different combinations of picks that the teams could give or that then you could also give um, and then tries to uh, find the point, like the matching point. So seeing what kind of points would they give up, what kind of points would you get? Um, and then and then you set a certain threshold to try to only see the trades possible b- uh, below some value. So if you don't, you know, if you're willing to give up 50 JJ points, then you can see trades up to 50 JJ points. Um, and so within this tool, then it sorts them by the ones that are the most equal. So it's just trying to find which trades are the most fair for both teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it is shockingly accurate the way that teams will make this trade. When, uh, when you're on draft night, it's, it's very typical. You'll know a team traded down, you'll know the team they traded it to, and you can almost with certainty pick the two for one or two for two trade that will get you there directly in terms of JJ value. And it's almost always that's the trade that was actually made. Occasionally you'll see somebody throw in change for a really high pick to get a a key player, but generally outside the first round um, that won't happen either. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a highly predictable kind of occurrence on draft night. Yeah. And so hopefully with this tool, even if you don't know the team that they traded to, you'll be able to look at the tool and try to quickly figure that out where you think that trade was made to as well. Okay. Well, that's, that's certainly true. And then hopefully even more in advance, identify who the trade partners really are. So they're not a bunch of wasted phone calls. Now the Ravens know who the the trade (laughs) partners are, but uh, you'd hope that there'd be uh, a, you know, reasonable uh, understanding about that from them certainly, but, but uh, you know, just to, just to, kind of be playing along at home, you know, with Jeopardy, you, uh, you can try and get it right. All right. Outstanding. So you, you've gone through your tool here a little bit. Let's talk about trade partners for the Ravens that, that, that could work in this draft. Yeah. So if you remember the number 22 pick is worth, I'm um, a, uh, um, uh, 780 points. Um, one interesting note is that there's only one team that could give us that exact point value without us giving up more picks. <laughs> And uh, I just thought it was funny, and that is the Steelers. They'd have to give us their uh, second round and also a third round pick. Um, second round would be number 32, so it'd be pretty high for them. Um, but that's the only fair trade we have without us having to give up anything extra. So 32 and 80 for 22. Correct. Okay. Uh, I, I, I kind of like the idea of that. It sounds like it'd be a pretty reasonable deal for the Ravens. Certainly does in a flat draft, if you believe everybody from 20 to 40 is roughly equivalent you don't mind dropping down to 32 certainly and picking up change yeah um i think within within the division it may be less likely just because the steelers may not want to help the ravens as much but um if there's a player that they really like which um usually i i think of trading up being more for a quarterback or some star player that and that teams really fall in love with um and it just seems to me less likely for the steelers to do something like that um receivers are usually uh, something and that teams trade up for but steelers usually find that much later yeah, they do have good positional coaching there. They've always been able to lean on to to create quality. Okay, well, maybe the Steelers aren't the team. Who might be the team? Yeah, um, uh, the team that stuck out to me the most are the Lions. Uh, they have the most JJ value over all the teams. Um, and they also have uh, 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 many picks as well. So they have 3,500 JJ value. Um, so... And the reason why they, so then they stick out to me is that um, we could, uh, we could trade with them a second round. Uh, so then we would get a second round, uh, second round, and then also a six round pick. Um, and they seem to be a team that's trying to compete. Um, so that would be uh, plus two points for us benefit. Um, and a team that's really trying to compete, they may be trying to get more top picks um, trying to really, you know, go for it just like a Rams kind of deal. Um, and this is maybe a little bit more safe than the Rams kind of deal. So um, I just feel like that could be the most likely trade-up. Um, that would be 48, 55, and also 194. 
uh, for them to give us for that. Okay. So one of the things I look at, when I look at the Lions, I see a lot of overlapping positional need. So they, they're, needs are often okay they lost a, a free agent to a cornerback to free agency but they need a cornerback a wide receiver and defensive line which are, are definitely three of the ravens biggest needs in this draft a lot of people haven't really come around a defensive line but defensive line the ravens have a lot of people graduating out of the system four players who may be gone next year but between pierce broderick washington justin matabike uh Calais campbell's already gone but but the fourth is urban who signed only a one-year deal so Travis Jones is the only sure thing guy they have beyond 2023. And if the Lions have very similar needs coming back to them, does that make them a good trade partner, a bad trade partner, or are the Lions really getting the guy they want and they can give up the next two to the Ravens and maybe still get players that, that uh, they like at those positions? I think that could make them a good trade partner because it's kind of both – both sides are giving up something like the Ravens will be giving up a player in the first round that they really like. And we know that the Lions will probably pick that. Um, the Lions can then take that player that they know that we would have picked that maybe they wouldn't be able to get just kind of a, you know, um, uh, Lions give up, you know, an extra player later, but they get a better player than us within like this overlapping uh, needs that we both have, um, which to me then makes a, a, a trade more fair if both sides are giving things up. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So 48 would be the pick, the first pick, the, or do I have that number That's wrong? That's correct, 48. Okay, so the, the players available at 22 and 48 don't really overlap that much. So that that's not that wouldn't be too much of a, a giveaway, I wouldn't think, for them. So, all right. That's, you know, it's definitely, it's, it's a decision to be made by both sides in there. Uh, uh, very interesting. I wonder if the Ravens would do that because they certainly would lose out on one of the top. I think they would probably lose out, let me put it that way, on one of the top quarters if they wait till 48 to draft. Uh, where do you think that the Ravens then should be trying to trade into and into what numbers, like talent wise? I, I would think staying in the top 35 to 38 would be good if they could do it and, and you know, still get some spare change on that. There's, there's, I think seven cornerbacks. I'd have to look at my own sheet again that I really like uh, with Deontay Banks really being the last of those seven. Uh, and, and he's, he's pretty damn good, but the, the guy I really love is Emmanuel Forbes. I hope if he's available at 22, that the Ravens will take him. Uh, but uh, if they, if he's not, then I'd understand why they would, they would trade down and, and they could even get Forbes later than that. Yeah. Um, which I guess goes back to Steelers if we want to get within the first 35 to be equal trade. Um, but then moving beyond those as well, like some of the ones, if we're trying to get stay within the top 35, the Texans, I think, could be a, a high likelihood of a trade. Mm -hmm. um, they're a team that has been not competing and maybe now they want to compete. If, you know, if a quarterback falls, that could be a kind of thing that they'd be looking for as well within those kinds of um, uh, picks. Um so for, for them, it's a little bit more complicated because if we don't give anything up, uh, the best trade that we could do is a round two and round three uh, uh, to, uh, to get from them. Uh, that would be number uh, pick number 33 and also pick number 70, uh, uh, 73. So this would give us a surplus of 25 points. Um, so they may be less likely because of that. Um, but then we could start to include our own picks to try to level that out. Um, so we could get uh, uh, one more six round pick from them and then give up a fourth round from ours to be able to try to make that level. Okay. All right. So that, that would be a fairly major trade there. Uh, and the Texans, I guess I, th I, the Texans have the second pick. So they are probably going to acquire their quarterback there would be my guess. I, I have heard rumblings that they don't really love Stroud that much. To me, he's probably the safest quarterback in this draft, but uh, that Bryce Young will probably be taken first and he cut off his visits. And so Stroud will probably be the second player taken. Uh, or, or they don't want to take the chance on Richardson, who I think a lot of people would say has the highest ceiling of the quarterbacks, uh, but but obviously is a very risky pick to make it number at number two overall when Stroud seems to be much more of a, of a, well, to me, much more of a sure thing. He has much more of a normal quarterback presence than the other guys. 
Yeah, and so the and so the Texans could also trade down from that second pick to somewhere in the teens, get the Richardson there, and then that would make them more likely to want to come back up into the twenties to surround him with some talent or uh, bolster the rest of their team as well. So that's where um, uh, I think like a uh, a trade up from them uh, could be possible, um, strictly based off of the JJ chart, and then also that they uh, maybe wanted to get more talent as well. Okay. All right, it's outstanding. So one of the things I'm noticing, and, and he sent me a, a, a sheet of every team here and, and how these you know work out, but there's only a few teams that make really good trade partners for the Ravens for this first round pick. And you know, in terms of your you know, high, you know, highly correlated or very close in terms of the total value value exchange on a relatively small number of picks, it's the Colts, the Texans, the Lions are really the only three unless you think the Steelers are a good chance. The Steelers are an on the money pick, but within the division. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of teams that could meet us within the JJ value, um, but then they don't have a lot of picks. So that's where I kind of put it more as like a medium chance or something low that um, for instance, you know, and so that they just, you know, won't want to make that trade up. Um, and so that kind of, I think is, Part of the symptom of this draft as well, you have the Lions having a lot of picks, the 49ers having a lot of picks. Um, They're owning so many picks, and so many teams don't have first-round picks as well. So that's making it harder to find uh, trade partners within here. Um, So within some of these trades here, um, some of them we may have to give up something. So if we look at somebody like the Packers, uh, if they want to move up uh, to get number 22, they'd be giving up round two, round three, and round four. But then we have to eat uh, um, uh, 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 70 JJ points from that. So that gives us more picks. And this kind of trade-off that we may, and that, and that the cost may have to start to uh, wager between. Um, do, we, you know, do, uh, do we just get more picks and then give up some of that point value? Um, or do we just put all of our points into that number one pick in the first round? Which I think as we started this conversation, um, we probably don't want to do. We probably want to get more players. Mm-hmm. Well, it it definitely seems logical if you if you have more needs than you have you know draft picks, you probably want to deal with that. Now the Ravens will deal with their needs with the extended free agency period, and and the the, the second period has always been more productive for the Ravens because there's no compensatory uh, value to it after May first. There's no compensatory offset if they if they sign someone. The Nelson Aguilar signing cost the Ravens a sixth round draft pick in the 2024 draft, which is, is very frustrating in terms of, of the uh, you know, the cost of, of, of him is, is much higher than I would have expected, but uh, it is what it is uh, in, in terms of, uh, of picks for this year, though, the Ravens do have a, a, just a, a very limited number of options of what they can do. And they have to somehow address it via free agency. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of unfortunate since we're here trying to figure out how can we get more picks and then we're giving up a six-round pick next year already. Um, and this may be a kind of game that we'll play next year as well of trying to figure out how do we get more picks. Um, it's definitely unfortunate. And I think that this draft is just one that's hard to need to trade down. Um, it's 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 very unfortunate with that because of the talent and also just because of the way that, of, of how the teams are owning the different picks. Um which is why I think that we should be calling the Lions on the phone and trying to see what they want to, you know, if they want to move up or not. I think that seems to be the most likely and the best scenario for us. Um, as uh, as you also said, the Colts uh, also for me are a high chance. Um, I know that a lot of teams, you know, people are saying that we could trade Lamar to them and that'd be us most likely trading up with them. But um, trading down would be a possibility as well. Um, they would trade us their uh, second round, third round, and fifth round. Um, to be able to get the number 22 pick. So that would make us very happy with that. Um, and so it's a possibility in both directions, I think, with them. Okay. Well, that's that's good to understand that flexibility going either way. Um, other points you would make about, about strategies the Ravens might take on draft night, and particularly on that first night. Yeah, I think um, I think the best strategy is just getting out of the first round. Uh, that will give us the most value. Um, we're going to have to see, obviously, how the picks are going. Um, but I, I would suspect, based off of everything that we've discussed and kind of the analysis we've done, the Ravens may have to give up some some uh, JJ points to be able to move down. 
Um, and you're going to have to eat that cost of the JJ points just to be able to get more picks. Um, and I think that would be worth it for them. You get in a couple of second rounders and maybe like a third kind of deal to give up some points would just uh, make uh, make the draft uh, better. Um, these are all kind of like I'm a, 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 I'm a, a lottery tickets a little bit. So um, the more we have, the better it will be. Yeah, I, for, for what it's worth. I hate it when DaCosta calls them lottery tickets. And I, I kind of understand what he means, but it's not the it's not the correct analogy. A lottery ticket means everybody has the same chance to win. By definition, that's what a lottery ticket. This is more like a World Series of Poker entry where DaCosta is, you know, Dan Harrington or uh, Phil Ivey and the other GMs are me trying to win the poker tournament. Uh, he, his His chance to win on a lower round lottery ticket is a lot higher than you know the other gms and so he's he's well served to go after and get those uh, additional draft picks but i i i i cringe every time i hear the lottery ticket thing i understand it's it's it, a lot of cases it's lower than a 50 percent chance to work out but it's it's the wrong characterization it's the best chance to work out it might be 37 percent for the ravens but it's 28 percent if you're the packers and it's 26 percent if you're the lions kind of thing that's the way to think of this. It's it's uh, it's not that the uh, uh, you know that it isn't better in the Ravens' hands. I have that draft pick. All right, Philippe. Always a pleasure talking football with you. It's been way too long. Uh, I've, I've uh, you know always enjoy our conversations. But tell people where they can talk football with you online. Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, uh, Philippe J. Daybeck. Uh, uh, F I L I P J. D A B E K. Um, I definitely follow everything Ken. And so definitely read Twitter a lot. So um, uh, uh, you can definitely hit me up on there. And so I'll definitely share the tool on there so people can play around with it. um, Try to explore some of these trades and maybe we can find something that'd be great for the Ravens to do. All right. And we already know that Philippe's not joining us on draft night, which is too damn bad, but we'll be using his tool and if you have questions or you want to talk about the tool or you just want to we'll link it inside our draft coverage there as well. And hopefully people will get a chance to see it and, uh, and use it. Philippe, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next time on film study.